Good morning. I want to welcome our panel of witnesses and everyone else to our hearing on U.S.-India trade relations. It's an honor and privilege to be chairing my first hearing as Trade Subcommittee Chairman and to be serving with my colleague, Ranking Member uh, Charles Rangel. Under Chairman Camp and Chairman Brady's leadership, the previous Congress passed seven bipartisan trade bills. These achievements show that Congress and the White House, Republicans and Democrats, can come together to pursue pro-growth, pro-job policies. We must now accelerate this momentum so that U.S. businesses, farmers, ranchers, and workers will find new opportunities abroad where 95 percent of the world's consumers live. That takes us to the focus of today's hearing. India has risen rapidly since its market opening reforms in the early 1990s. Its GDP has grown from $275 billion in 1991 to $1.8 trillion in 2012. Nevertheless, India remains the largest recipient of benefits under the U.S. generalized system of preferences. This is a program that expires this July this committee must deal with. The U.S.-India strategic partnership is a key relationship with bilateral trade in goods and services rising from a minuscule amounts 25 years ago to more than $86 billion a year now. But there is scope for much more. With a population of over $1.2 billion, India's market holds potential for world-class U.S. products and services. I want to ensure that U.S. job creators compete there on a level playing field. This hearing will provide an opportunity for the committee to explore the positive aspects of the U.S.-India economic relationship, as well as to examine India's tariff and non-tariff barriers that are acting as impediments. In particular, I want to examine the following issues. Deepening and expanding the long-term trade and investment relationship, understanding the existing U.S.-India bilateral fora for discussion and how they can be more effective in addressing bilateral irritants and establishing metrics for measuring progress. Addressing India's troubling use of forced localization in key sectors. Ensuring India's protection of intellectual property rights. Addressing agricultural market access barriers to ensure a level playing field for U.S. farmers and ranchers. Completing a bilateral investment treaty. Addressing investment camps and exploring new bilateral investment opportunities which are all vital to U.S. growth. And finally, partnering with India to advance negotiations at the WTO, including a post-Doha issue such as information technology agreement expansion, a trade facilitation agreement, and the international services agreement negotiations that are about to be launched in Geneva. I look forward to having a comprehensive discussion today about promoting economic growth and job creation by solving difficult bilateral issues. Thank you, Mr. Garfield. Mr. Waldron. Chairman Nunes, Ranking Mer Member Rangel, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Roy Waldron, and I serve as the Chief Intellectual Property Counsel at Pfizer. In that capacity, I'm responsible for managing and protecting Pfizer's intellectual property portfolio worldwide. Pfizer was founded in 1849. Our mission is to apply science to improve the health and well-being of people's lives. We have developed some of the world's best-known pharmaceutical products. We employ 90,000 individuals worldwide and 30,000 in the U.S. We have a presence in all 50 states. Uh, with 17 manufacturing facilities and 21 R&D sites located throughout the U.S. In the U.S., our industry supports over 4 million jobs, invests over 35 billion annually in R&D, and exports 46 billion in goods. The pharmaceutical sector is the country's sixth largest exporter. 95% of our consumers are outside the United States. Emerging markets like India are our key growth markets. R&D is the lifeblood of our industry. It produces new and innovative medicines to treat diseases for patients worldwide, and intellectual property rights protect the fruits of our innovation. Today, it takes, on average, more than $1 billion in 10 to 15 years to research and develop a new medicine. Our industry is high risk. Only about 1 in 10,000 compounds ever enters the drug discovery phase and is approved by the FDA. India is a critical growth market for Pfizer and for the pharmaceutical sector generally. Pfizer is committed to India and has been operating there for over 60 years. Yet the business environment for innovative industries has deteriorated significantly and created uncertainty in that market. India has taken steps that call into question the sustainability of foreign investment and the ability to compete fairly. India has essentially created a protectionist regime that harms U.S. job creators. Despite being a member of the WTO and an important global trading partner, 
India has systematically failed to interpret and apply its IP laws in a manner consistent with recognized global standards. In fact, the Global IP Center's International IP Index ranked India last in terms of overall IP protection. In September of last year, India revoked Pfizer's patent for a cancer medication, Sutent. The patent for Sutent was granted in 90 countries around the world, including India, the United States, Europe, and Japan. The India, Indian patent had been in effect for five years prior to its revocation. The revocation will now allow Indian generic companies to manufacture and sell generic copies of Sutent long before the patent is set to expire. I'd like to note that to ensure Sutent is available to patients who need it, Pfizer developed a patient access program in India. The program provides 80% of the patients taking Sutent with a complete or partial subsidy. We believe that India is undermining IP by misuse of its compulsory license provisions. Compulsory licenses are intended for use in extraordinary situations of extreme urgency or other national emergency. Last March, India issued a compulsory license for a cancer medicine, Nexavar, that the Indian government had justified in part because the product was imported rather than manufactured locally. Such an industrial policy plainly contravenes established international trade obligations. Recent reports indicate that India has started the process of issuing compulsory licenses for the manufacture of three additional cancer medicines under a public emergency provision that sidesteps notice and public comment obligations. If left alone, this trend will destroy the market for innovative pharmaceuticals in India. And since many other countries look to India as a leader and an, and an example, India's actions reverberate far beyond its borders. We have seen several countries adopt policies similar to India's, which are leading to a worldwide deteriorating trend on intellectual property rights. These actions also diminish our exports, jeopardize our R&D activities, and ultimately harm U.S. jobs. We need your help. We need the support of Congress and the administration. It is vital that you prioritize this matter and work together to address these challenges. Specifically, I'd like to highlight four recommendations. That the U.S. government increase the frequency of talks with the Indian government and continue to raise concerns directly with U Indian officials. That the U.S. government should raise concerns at every available bilateral and multilateral forum to send a strong signal to the Indian government and to other governments that it does not condone these actions. The U.S. government should review all available policy, trade policy tools in light of the deteriorating IP environment. The U.S. government should, and for U.S. government should pursue a robust trade agenda that includes strong intellectual property protections, including robust provisions in the Trans-Pacific Partners Partnership Agreement. Thank you for holding this hearing today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Waldron. So as you all know, this committee has basically two major capabilities. Thank you, Mr. Garfield. You're welcome. Mr. Waldron. I have to echo the, uh, the comments of my fellow, fellow panelists, um, but I think that uh, some of the emphasis has to be on intellectual property. I think that uh, we do, there is an exigency, as uh, Mr. Garfield uh, references, uh, the acceleration of compulsory license policies has accelerated in the last year, so there is some urgency with respect to uh, the frequency of talks that we have with the Indian government and, and to register our displeasure with the developments that have taken place there. Um, I, I also agree that, that IP chapters or IP understandings are also important in these bilateral and, and multilateral fora. So this is, this is, is really something, uh, as a second matter, that I think we really have to pursue and uh, go with our eyes wide open as to what is really happening right now. And essentially, if we wait too long, we may find ourselves in a situation where it's irremediable. Um, and uh, referring back to some earlier comments on GSP, I, I think that we do have to uh, review all available policy tools. Uh, I think it's a, a matter of, of equity and fairness. And uh, Perhaps the, the upcoming renewal will be a time to actually seriously look at, at what we want to do and how we want to do that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waldron. Uh, with that, uh, my thank you. Mr. Larson is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Nunez and uh, Mr. Rangel and our distinguished guests that are here today. The uh, testimony has been enlightening, and uh, uh, certainly we all uh, share the concerns and uh, the great opportunity that exists with the vast potential of uh, India. 
I'd like to uh, amplify a point that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Neal made, and one that continues to be a thorny issue for uh, this committee and manu American manufacturers uh, in general. And uh, that has to de that deals with the issue of intellectual properties. And um, having several uh, value-added manufacturers uh, in the Northeast and specifically in the state of Connecticut and one testifying today in terms of Pfizer's, uh, I'd like to get uh, the perspective, if I could, uh, uh, Mr. Waldron, uh, from you and other panelists if they uh, want to um, uh, join in uh, about the difficulties that uh, American companies uh, face. I believe it was Mr. Garfield that talked about the complications of preferential markets and the bureaucratic entanglements uh, that that creates and, of course, the ongoing concern that so many American manufacturers have related to us about intellectual property. If you could, sir. Mr. Walton. Um, thank, thank you, Congressman Larson. Um, uh, I, think, I think we have to sort of talk about balance here um, uh, in, in the intellectual property area. I mean, even though India will proclaim that it's consistent with uh, trade obligations in terms of its, its patent law, uh, we've had in the recent past about eight, eight sort of cases that have come up dealing with patented products. And frankly, we're, we're dealing with a situation where we're zero and eight in terms of the patent being upheld or uh, any compulsory, any sort of pushing back on a compulsory license or uh, revocation actions. I, I, I think it speaks to a very uh, poor record and there's something out of balance. I mean, the rest of the world has IP provisions uh, that are consistent with international obligations, yet we're so far uh, uh, towards the, the range where everything uh, is revoked or there is no valid patent in India. I think we really have to sort of address this quickly before it becomes a very dire situation and we find ourselves where we really have, have nothing left. Would you uh, say that that's uh, because of uh, an ensnarled bureaucracy or more of a deliberate plan of uh, India. Well, uh, I can't speak to the intentions of, of, of the Indian government, but uh, I think the, the government there should play a role and does play a role in at least communicating what it finds important and its priorities. So if all the administration made, administrative agencies are deciding cases in a certain way, that seems to be reflective of the tone that is being set um, at the highest levels. Um, I, I I, I really think that, they, that there is um, a role that the Indian government can do in communicating to its agencies um, in terms of uh, creating a more positive environment because, frankly speaking, it's like their interests lie in creating a culture of innovation as we do here. The IP system has been the driver, uh, the historic driver of innovation over many years and contributed to the, the, the great pr prosperity that we enjoy in this country. Uh, it's something that we should share. I think it's a legacy that we have to bring to them simply because we're in a, in a world where we don't have drug products that cure all diseases. I think we really need to get further along and it's like, and, and, and these are interests that we all, we all share in common with every country regardless of border. So uh, the emphasis really has to be on innovation and, and there really needs to be messages from the top uh, within India. If I could, if I could add, sure. there, there are multiple forces at play here and so in part it is bureaucracy, in part it's a slowing economy and markets like India looking at China and that model and thinking that may be the path to take. And so the point that has been made about creating opportunities for multi-directional or bi-directional dialogue, so we're exchanging ways in which their interests can be met as well as ours, and when I say ours, I mean global companies, uh, I think will serve us all well. The, the concern I have is, and not to sound too much like the boy who cried wolf, but is that some of these some of these challenges that are progressing now could become non remediable uh, if we don't address them immediately, and so creating those opportunities and that dialogue uh, immediately I think is critically important 
I believe it was Gandhi that said, um, I want all the winds of the world to be able to blow freely through my house, right. mm -hmm. but I will not be blown over by any. And it seems to me, both Mr. Waldron and Mr. Garfield, that what you have said, this would enhance their ability to stand with the rest of the world. Thank you. Well articulated. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Larson. Mr. Bastani is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Kynes recognized. Thank for you, Mr. Minutes. Chairman, and thank you for holding this very in insightful and helpful hearing. And I want to thank the witnesses for your excellent testimony here today. And uh, this is a crucial relationship, not only geopolitically but economically. And it's one that's going to require a lot of care and nurturing and attention as we move forward, given some of the challenges and the obstacles that we face. I had the chance, Mr. Chairman, last October to head to India for a few days with. with Adam Smith, Duncan Hunter, and a couple other members. And it wasn't just New Delhi. We got out into the countryside and the various cities, too. And it was a fascinating place with tremendous potential, but also some, some huge challenges uh, in regards to our economic relationship. And Ambassador Johnson, I appreciate your update on where we are with the agricultural sphere of it and, and uh, the difficulties that we still face there, trying to get India to open up a little bit more in regards to our own ag products. And coming from my home state of Wisconsin, dairy obviously is a source of concern. And, Mr. Chairman, I noticed that the National Milk Producers and the, the Dairy Export Council submitted a statement for today's hearing. I'm not sure if it was officially included in the record, but I'd ask unanimous consent at this time to have it included uh, With, if it wasn't. Without objection. Thank you. Um, but, Mr. Subramanian, um, something that you mentioned earlier when you're going through your litany of three things as far as U.S.-India relations. The final one was what not to do, and that's GSP. Obviously, that's coming up for reauthorization. And given the compulsory license decision that they've made right now, which is very unsettling and could detrimentally affect India and foreign investment going into the country, but also some of the other hurdles that we face, agriculture or otherwise, your recommendation is not to use that as a point of leverage as far as engaging uh, India. But assuming we did, what would the consequences be uh, if they – lost GSP preference from us, and what would that mean as, as we move forward? Uh, 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 that's a, gr uh, a great question, Mr. Kind. Uh, my sense is that uh, the loss of GSP in quantitative terms will not be huge for India. Uh, uh, you know, uh, India basically exports a lot of high-tech, uh, you know, uh, more advanced goods. Uh, and apart from a few things here and there, I, I think the quantitative impact will not be great. So, so it, it doesn't make for a very strong uh, uh, lever vis-a-vis -vis uh, vis -vis India. But I think it's going to, you're going to incur the diplomatic cost because this will be symbolically seen as a kind of you know, retaliatory action or, 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 or so. That's why I think on, on the, the balance of costs and benefits, uh, I would be uh, a little hesitant about using that. And on the compulsory licensing, I do agree with Mr. Uh, uh, Waldron that, uh, you know, there are a few things in Indian law, like Section 3D of the Indian Patent Act ha has these requirements on, you know, the requirements for a patent, the efficacy re requirement or, or the working requirement. I think these are things that are well tested in the WTO. Mm. I mean, I don't think we need to resort to re retaliatory threats to get these changes. Because I think, because India might be out of line with international practice, I think it's good to get an international verdict. But you think it would be fair game as we come up with reauthorization of GSP to be looking at India and other countries involved too in regards to whether we, want, we need to at this point of development extend those preferences to, to India or some other yeah, but, 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 that's, but that should be a more generic discussion, right? Again. Because, uh, right. as I said, why should a country that grants GSP receive GSP? And that's true for many countries. Uh, but, but that's a different conversation and a different dynamic from using yeah. this as a specific well, Mr. Waldron, let me go back to the compulsory license issue in that. And uh, assuming they're moving forward on this, what would be the impact on foreign investment or – other private companies looking to do business in, in India if they go down this road? Well, I, I can't speak to uh, all the individual com countries, but I would say that, look, if you're, you're an innovator and you're trying to sell innovative products there, you're going to find yourself in competition with numerous other products. It's like we've had products on the market there that didn't have patent protection. We were, we were competing against 60 other competitors marketing, marketing the same thing. So obviously the consequences of that are dire. Uh, I guess in talking about trade instruments or trade tools, um, 
I, I do think that they're somewhat of a blunt instrument to try to deal with something that you're really trying to get focus on. If you're trying to focus on specific issues, you may not get that through the revocation of certain preferences or a WTO case, which has all kinds of unintended consequences. But I do, you really have to send strong messages on the things that you believe are priorities. And I think that that's really the starting point. But obviously, we don't have a lot of time. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly encourage this committee, with your leadership, to continue to focus on India and any parliament, the congressional exchanges that we might have, too, so we can have the dialogue at that level, I think would be very helpful and productive as we move forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Kind. Mr. Paulson is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, also for holding this hearing. Um, great testimony today. Uh, I, I, I really have appreciated the uh, kind of the reinforcement about what I've heard about these disturbing trends within India kind of turning inward and erecting more barriers to trade and investment and kind of turning back the clock, if you will. And so some real challenging opportunities for us moving forward. One of Minnesota's largest exports to India is in the area of medical technology. And unfortunately, I understand that United States medical manufacturers are facing incredible challenges now selling their products in India, including lack of transparency in pricing under India, India's uh, central government health care scheme, uh, as well as discriminatory government procurement policies. And there's no doubt that American medical device companies are well positioned to partner with the Indian government toward improving health care access and outcomes and awareness and developing much needed more stronger health care infrastructure. But they're going to have a difficult time doing so in the current environment. Mr. Waldron, you touched on some of this from the drug perspective. Now, can you also maybe comment from the perspective of maybe how an American medical device company might have difficulty selling their products in India, and is it going to be helpful to have a renewed or a revised bilateral trade dialogue in this area addressing this industry's concerns? Um, I guess very generally, I think it's probably one of the one of the more important tools a bilateral approach might uh, 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 be helpful. I guess it all depends on the particularities of what's what's included in that. So I would say that it's amongst the uh, instruments that you could uh, move forward on. But I, I think, it, uh, I mean, a lot of medical instruments also depend on uh, intellectual property and sort of the respect for the innovation that's coming in. So I think it's sort of like part and parcel of the same kind of, 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 of environment what they're trying, we're trying to create there. Uh, I think we're all experiencing it in the same way. Our innovation really isn't being respected and it's being pushed back. Yeah, the, the, thing that I, the thing that I would add there is, particularly in the context of GSP being coming up for renewal, before we get there, I think we have an opportunity to engage in the kind of bi-directional bi dialogue uh, so that we can talk strategically about differing interests uh, that can help us advance and resolve some of the challenges we're facing, facing in the market. And so it's something that we would highly endorse.